All right, everybody, it's just after 12. We're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome, and thank you again for joining us today. My name is Melissa DeMars, and I am the Northern Michigan Behavioral Health Consultant for the Michigan Opioid Collaborative. This is the Northern Michigan Roundtable on Extended Release Buprenorphine. We'll be focusing specifically on Sublocade today. Uh, our presenter is Dr. Paul Trowbridge, whom I'll introduce shortly. Just a couple of things before we get started. If you haven't already, please sign into the chat with your name, email address, and organization. This helps us ensure you receive the presentation slides and any other resources that are shared today. Please be sure to mute yourself if you are not speaking. Our roundtables are less didactic, uh, so once Dr. Trowbridge concludes his presentation, we encourage questions and dialogue. Just a reminder, the roundtable does not offer continuing education credits. If you have questions, please use the Q&A function instead of the chat. We will address those questions at the end of the presentation. So if you look at the bottom of your screen, you should see the Q&A icon between the participant and chat icon. Please click on the Q&A and post your questions in there. We'll be monitoring that section and we will do our best to make sure all questions get answered. I'm going to review uh, the Michigan Opioid Collaborative briefly. We are an interdisciplinary team supporting providers and communities to increase access to office-based addiction treatment and expand care as well as improve quality of care for folks with opioid and other substance use disorders throughout the state. The MOC is grant funded through Blue Cross Blue Shield and MDHHS. We do offer free same-day patient consultation services to help provide evidence-based quality addiction treatment. Our team of physician specialists are available to help with patient case questions related to treatment and management of substance use disorders Monday through Friday, 9 to 5 Eastern Standard Time. The MOC offers quarterly introduction to buprenorphine trainings as well as webinars on a variety of educational topics such as addiction, stigma, and substance use. Many of our trainings and webinars offer free CMEs, CEUs, and MCBAP credits. All of our MOC educational events offering CMEs do meet the new DEA eight-hour substance use education requirement. Uh, we do have toolkits that we've created for providers to have more resources when treating patients with multiple substance use disorders. All of our resources and toolkits are available through our website, and I will put that in the chat uh, shortly. Okay, I'm gonna stop um, screen sharing and uh, introduce our presenter. So Dr. Paul, Dr Paul Trowbridge completed his medical school training at the Wayne State University School of Medicine. He subsequently went to Brown University of Rhode Island Hospital for his internal medicine internship and residency. He obtained his master's in public health while doing the, his infectious disease fellowship at Tufts University Tufts Medical Center prior to completing his second fellowship in addiction medicine at Boston University Boston Medical Center. He currently practices clinical addiction medicine at Trinity Health in Grand Rapids. He also works on the Michigan Health Endowment Fund's Hospital Engagement Addiction Resources Team Initiative, which looks to expand access to addiction services for hospitalized patients. He serves as the medical director for the Red Project, one of the Midwest's largest harm reduction organization, and sits on the Health Professional Recovery Committee for the state of Michigan. He is passionate about expanding access to evidence-based care for persons with substance use disorders, particularly in rural communities. So with that, thank you, Dr. Trowbridge, for being here, and I'm going to hand it over to you. Hi. Can everyone see my slides? I think I shared yes. that correctly. Fabulous. Uh -huh. That's a grand introduction there. It makes okay. me sound so I fancy. Thank you for sharing. Um, well, we're going to talk about extended release buprenorphine products. Um, if I can advance here, anyway. Or not. So when we're talking about extended release buprenorphine products, uh, there's Sublocade, which is a once monthly dose. And there's also Rixati, which just hit the market. Um, it's available in a once monthly and a once weekly dose. As um, I'm guessing nobody has much clinical experience with that. I don't know anyone who's doing that yet, though I know some people who are going to start it. We're going to focus mostly on the Sublocade for the once monthly dosing there. Um, so brand name alert, we will be discussing Sublocade. And because it's the only available formulation of this, there is no generic. I'm not going to keep saying extended release um, buprenorphine as that 
other products would meet that qualification now. So brand name alert, I will be saying Sublicate because it's the only product we're really going to be talking about. Um, I do not work for anyone. They're not paying me anything to say anything nice about them. Um, so Sublicate, what, <laughs> excuse me, I have a cold, so I will probably be making intermittent disgusting sounds. I apologize. What is um, Sublicate? It is a once monthly um, subcutaneous depot injection of buprenorphine. It's typically given every 28 days, um, but can be given up to day 26. So it can be given a couple of days early if we uh, need some flexibility there. It's not like Vivitrol that you can give it a week early. It's just a couple of days, um, but it um, typically given every 28 days or as soon as possible after day 28. There's not a specific um, guideline for if you're late on your, your dose, which people quite often are. It's injected into the subcutaneous fat on the abdomen and it's rotated through the quadrants of the abdomen. So it rotates through four different sites in a circle um, so that you don't inject the same place twice. It, it When it's injected, it creates a, um, a solid. It becomes a, uh, from a liquid in the syringe into a solid when it touches bodily fluids. Um, and creates a little pencil eraser sized nub under the under the skin um, that people can usually feel. How do we start it? Um, someone needs to be on subcutaneous buprenorphine for at least a week prior to being um, started on, on sublocate. And the dosing range is quite wide um, from eight to 24 milligrams of subcutaneous buprenorphine. Um, people often want to know how quickly does it take effect? It's very quickly. Um, the official um, site for Sublicade says it's active within 24 hours, but it's usually within 20 or 30 minutes. Um, so it's very quickly active in the patient, but um, we say within 24 hours. What are the doses that are available? It's typically given as 300 milligrams for the first two months as a loading dose. And then we're not really stepping down and because uh, we, we try to avoid talking about that because it freaks people out that suddenly we're decreasing their dose. We're not really decreasing their dose. We're maintaining the dose. If you started off at the 100 milligrams, you would get to the same end location at the end. It would just take longer to get there. So it's 300 milligrams for the first two months. And it looks kind of like this um, is how we're supposed to be looking at that. Um, a question that comes up frequently is, can you stay on the 300 milligram dose? Um, that's not the official way it's done, um, but for someone with a substantial opioid habit, fentanyl or injection drug use, um, it's not uh, unreasonable to do this. It is kind of important to remember that we also start people on the sublingual formulation as well, because if they're on 24 milligrams a day of sublingual buprenorphine, and that's not covering their opioid debt, buprenorphine might not be the correct treatment regimen and going up to 300 milligrams isn't going to do that much more. Um, more buprenorphine, the buprenorphine is super safe because of that ceiling effect. Um, more buprenorphine does not do more past a certain point, which is why it's super safe and nearly impossible to overdose on without taking something else with it. It also is what limits its utility. So if someone's on 24 milligrams a day of, of buprenorphine, most people aren't going to get much more out of, of uh, taking a higher dose. Similarly, there's people who are going to benefit from 300 milligrams um, dosing continuing after the first couple of months. Um, but I wouldn't jump to make that a reflex decision because buprenorphine just might not be the treatment for them, or maybe they need to go to detox first to get their tolerance down. But 300 milligrams is an option, and the company shows their um, site for this as well. Um, this two nanogram per microliter uh, um, level, the company really fixates on this as like, um, this is a really important thing. All that is, is um, and per their own literature and per their own studies, is at that point, 70% or greater of the mu opioid receptor is occupied. So there's a fairly thorough blockade of other opioids. And they'll outright say in their, in their literature, that doesn't necessarily mean that people aren't in withdrawal. That doesn't necessarily mean they're not having urges. That just means that 70% of the receptors are covered. Um, they can still be in withdrawal and, and having um, urges. And their own studies, though they didn't supplement sublingual buprenorphine in their studies, they gave a lot of medications for um, withdrawal control at the end of some months. And again, here's uh, kind of their, their um, graph of what's the importance of this two nanogram per milliliter um, level that they're trying to keep above. It's an occupied number of opioid receptors. Higher concentrations, uh, concentration levels may be needed to reduce um, opioid cravings. So 
I don't think that two mil uh, microgram per milliliter actually means that much. It's kind of a meaningless thing clinically, um, but they fixate a lot about it, made a big fuss about it when it first came out. Potential strengths of sublocade. Um, it's really nice because a lot of um, opioid use is that hand to mouth. I need to take something to feel okay. Um, this can help break that because you wake up in the morning and it's already there. You know, mid-afternoon rolls around, it's already there. Evening times rolls around, it's already there. You don't need to take something to feel okay. And that can be a really powerful thing for people. It can also help with adherence. If someone's really struggling, their work schedule doesn't allow them to take their doses regularly, their life's chaotic, they have mental illness that doesn't allow them to take things regularly, and so they're in and out of withdrawal. Um, this can be a stabilizing thing in that re uh, regard as well. Um, <laughs> Comparisons to sublingual buprenorphine, people have found it's a less lesser treatment burden, greater treatment satisfaction, and um, increased treatment convenience for what that's worth. Um, there hasn't been significant differences, to my knowledge, found, be found between sobriety, um, of the likelihood of maintaining abstinence, but people tend to like it better. And it's essentially non-divertible, non-losable. So if you have someone who's um, losing their prescriptions frequently, uh, things get stolen. I have a couple patients at local shelters where things are kind of chaotic, things go missing all the time. This can be a, a stabilizing thing in that regard as well to offer them something that, hey, you can't have this stolen, it's in your body. Potential weaknesses of this medication. Um, a lot of times people stop showing up between injections in all honesty. Um, they, if you have them coming to counseling regularly, uh, the people who want to be in counseling, they're going to keep showing up. The people who, you know, it was kind of a plus or minus thing, uh, quite often stop showing up because whether or not you want to give them a month of medication, you've given them a month of medication. Let me make sure I, I can't fully read this. Sorry, there's the picture on the side. Um, as I said, the company literature, when they they put out their, their, um, their studies uh, getting this approved, there wasn't any uh, additional supplemental buprenorphine being given in the study, but there's certainly uh, medications to help control withdrawal symptoms. Not everyone makes it the full 28 days, particularly in that first couple of months while you're getting that loading dose in. Um, sometimes people start to hit withdrawal. It's not like one day it magically hits and suddenly they have withdrawal. And I've definitely had patients who are like, oh no, I started throwing up. I must be in withdrawal. No, that's probably a GI bug. Um, it's not like suddenly the medication is not there. It's very gradually gets out of the system and they start feeling icky. Um, so that can definitely someone's speakers are on. Please make sure you're muted. If you could check your, your <laughs> mute. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so particularly in that first couple of months, a lot of people, and I'd say anecdotally, this is entirely my spitball estimate um, from seeing patients and not from official studies, because I'm not aware of any studies that have been done on this, but I'd say 15 to 20% of people in the first month or two particularly will have some mild withdrawal at the, at the end of the month, typically in the last week. Um, some of the people that will persist um, longer than the first couple of, of, of months. This may benefit from low dose supplementation. Um, a lot of people will throw their full dose of Suboxone that they were on previously or the full dose of buprenorphine that they were on previously at someone, that's not necessary. I mean, most of what was there the day before when they weren't in withdrawal is still there. So you can get away with really low dose supplementation, which Medicaid will cover. Um, typically, I start off at like two milligrams a day, typically pe keeps people out of withdrawal if they're in withdrawal at the end of the month. Um, and again, this, this graph, um, that line they're keeping all these things over um, actually is is showing uh, opioid mu receptor um, occupation, not necessarily um, cessation of withdrawal or urges. So people can still be getting withdrawal, even though they're above that magic line that the company got fascinated by. Very rarely, um, I would say, have I've witnessed two individuals um, become intoxicated on their first injection. Um, not past the first injection, but definitely the first injection. Um, that is exceedingly rare. Uh, the company, when I talked to the, their um, regional salesman or medical director several years ago, said no one else has said that, that that's not really a thing. But if you look at that magic graph down in the corner again, you do definitely get a big spike up front. So it is theoretically possible. 
Uh, most people, if they're on a stable dose of, of sublingual buprenorphine beforehand, that's not going to be an issue. Um, I bring it up only because I have personally seen it. Um, sometimes uh, providers want to use this as an attempt to force sobriety on someone. Um, but people uh, stop using in order to and um, use heroin or use whatever opioid they want. Uh, there might be some help to the patient if they can't stop the medication, but we shouldn't use this as a bludgeoning tool to force them into sobriety because, you know, um, if you can't stop using the buprenorphine, there's a very narrow window between the opioid blockade and overdosing. Um, it's a very narrow therapeutic window, so it's easy if you're forced to try to use an, an opioid on top of um, buprenorphine that you're going to get it wrong and overdose. Um, and I've actually seen one person build a full-fledged injection heroin habit on top of Sublicade, um, and that went very poorly for them. Their last words before they overdosed in the car next to their partner was, ah, that's the good shit. And then it took six Narcams to revive them. So um, not a good tool for forcing sobriety on people. We can't do that as providers in general. And um, and the company says this is rare, and I've actually never seen this or heard of this personally. Um, if there is some sort of emergency that the sublocate needed to be extracted, it is a solid not, uh, ball in the subcutaneous uh, tissue. It can be surgically removed if needed. And it does add some complexity to when deciding how to taper, which we'll get into a little bit here, because that's a frequent question that comes up. So tapering treatment. Um, Sublocate is actually approved for maintenance only, not for tapering purposes. Um, so this is intended by a company used in the FDA as something as a maintenance medication, like this is what I'm going to be doing for a while, let's just keep on it. Per drug company literature, um, the concentration can remain therapeutic for th two to five months afterwards, after the last injection, and be detectable for up to 12 months or longer afterwards. I have personally witnessed this and Someone we gave one injection of a sublocade to, they were incarcerated and per their account received no buprenorphine the entire time they were there and came out and still had it detectable in their urine 12 months later. So that seems very feasible. Um, tapering has been done um, and published on in a variety of manners using buprenorphine. <laughs> Excuse me, I'm sorry. Um, there has been a couple of uh, case um, studies um, demonstrating just stopping um, as a method of tapering, giving them a certain number of injections and then just stopping and letting it auto taper. I'd say those uh, the case studies are not necessarily translatable to real life situations most frequently. Uh, I believe reference three there is actually someone who was on a couple of people who are on very low dose buprenorphine um, and then received a single injection and tapered off and were successful. And there's been some other people who have voluntarily offered to use this as a tapering method. Um, my clinic that I'm at currently, before I was here, uh, had a couple of early successes with this of just giving people six months of sublocade and then just stopping, and it worked. That is not the expected outcome, and that should not be told to the patient as a guarantee because a far more frequent thing I see is, yeah, you don't necessarily develop a withdrawal immediately, but at some point you do. Um, and if someone's on this and goes into withdrawal, like say they're incarcerated at a, a facility that doesn't allow for um, medications for opioid use disorder, I've actually had one of my patients just sit there in withdrawal for like 12 months because of how long, how slowly it gets out of people's systems. And it did not auto taper nicely for them. It just kept them in withdrawal that whole time. Um, it has been discussed at national meetings, truly tapering like we would any other opioid, like giving 90% of the shot and then giving 80% of the shot and giving 70% of the shot and doing a 10% decrease. That has been discussed. I don't think there's a lot of knowledge about it. It's also been uh, talked about, though I think this is less sensible given the pharmacokinetics of just uh, increasing the duration between injections. Um, I have had, uh, I haven't personally had a patient, but I had a colleague who was successful at doing that. Um, the official manner of tapering remains going back to the sublingual formulation. It's a little bit messy because it's not like day 29 hits and sublocades on your system. Day 29 hits and 99% of what was there, day 28 is still there. So you very slowly get back on the films, usually starting off on like two milligram films and gradually increase again based on symptoms until they are stable again and you can taper them. Um, like I said, retitration is not... Uh, straightforward. You don't just restart what they were on pre-sublocade because most of what they had 
from the sublocate is still in their system and they just don't need that much sublingual. And you can get them an unrealistic level of, of buprenorphine by adding the full dose on top of essentially full dose sublocate. Obtaining the medication, uh, again, after someone has been on it, the sublingual formulation for at least seven days, um, the medication importantly can never be in possession of the patient. Um, this is for concerns of if they were to inject it themselves, if they injected it into a vein, it would become a solid in their vein and occlude their vein and probably cause them to have an amputation. Um, it should not be injected by anyone outside of the medical office. It is shipped directly to the medical office. Cost, it is 100% covered by Medicaid. Um, for private insurers, there's often a copay. Um, the company has a fairly robust patient assistance form. So if you're going this route, we tend to have patients, if they've decided I'm going to go with the supplicate option, we have them sign this company assistant form that visit before we try to get a hold of the supplicate um, so that all our, um, all our ducks are in a row when we, we go to order it. It must be shipped from a specialty pharmacy. Um, uh, Medicaid tends to use Magellan pharmacies. Um, we have a specialty pharmacy here at Trinity Health that takes care of things for our Medicaid patients. Private insurance are whatever specialty pharmacy they want to use, and generally you have to call and, and figure out what that is. Um, very importantly, the pharmacies will not ship this medication unless the patient picks up their phone and tells the pharmacy that they're okay with it being shipped. Um, your office can't call, my office can't call, none of us can call and say ship it. It has to be the patient that agrees to that. So they should be told to pick up their phone if a pharmacy is calling so that they can approve it. Otherwise, they're going to come to the next appointment and the supplicate will not be there. Storage of the medication, this is literally just stolen from the um, supplicate handout. Um, importantly, you need to take it out at least 15 minutes um, before uh, it's administered. Um, and then once it's out of the refrigerator, you have to use it within seven days or discard it. You can, don't put it back in the refrigerator. Um, and then you see the rest of the, the things there. It has to generally be in a double locked system, both in a locked refrigerator and a locked box or in a locked room and a locked refrigerator. Um, administration, it goes in the subcutaneous fat of the abdomen. Um, and then we rotate the quadrants of administration monthly. Special cases, it comes up a fair bit, questions about supplicate in pregnancy. Um, supplicate is not officially recommended during pregnancy. Um, there is actually concern that part of the delivery vehicle may be teratogenic. Um, part of that matrix that makes it form a little uh, solid ball might be teratogenic or is in animal models anyway. And the pharmacokinetics are just not well understand. And this may risk putting someone into withdrawal, which of course can risk er uh, preterm labor. So we try to avoid that in pregnant patients. That being said, studies do exist uh, of use in pregnancy. Largely, people didn't know they were pregnant and were already on this medication, not they were switched over to it. Um, generally, it's encouraged to do a shared decision-making model, acknowledging that we don't have a, a good uh a good amount of data on this, but generally what's good for the mother is good for the pregnancy as well. Um, so if uh, she was having a lot of difficulty maintaining sobriety free, um, transitioning to this formulation of the medication, it might be reasonable to keep uh, keep her on it during the pregnancy, even though we have to acknowledge that we don't have all the, the information. But if she relapses, that's probably gonna be worse than any potential effects of the sublocade and past the first trimester, that uh, potential teratogenicity of the delivery vehicle isn't gonna matter much. There are my sources, and that's what I got. Happy to have discussion now and hear people's viewpoints. Thanks so much, Paul. Um, we do have one question in the Q&A section, I'll read it. Uh, what is your experience in using half doses? Example, the patient needs more than 100 milligrams monthly, but 300 milligrams monthly results in euphoria and intoxication. We've been advised previously we can use a half dose of 300 milligrams, but this presents difficulties in controlled med disposal and lack of precision as there are no graduations on the syringe. That is an excellent question. I have very limited experience with that. Um, my current health court organization does not allow us to do that because of the lack of uh, markings on the syringe and the uh, fear that that's not how the manufacturer intended it. I know um, providers that are doing that, uh, more the other direction to use it to taper, to give like that 90%, 80%, 70%. Um, I haven't heard of anyone using additional dosing, but that makes sense 
Um, I just don't have much experience with it or if that would be covered by insurance at all. Okay, thank you. Dr. McMorrow, I saw your hand raised. Yep. Um, so great presentation, Paul. Um, just to kind of add on to that um, answer, we do do some of that. We have an off-label form that we have the patient sign if we're going to kind of go in between, you know, do a 150 or a 175 or a 200. Um, if you do do that um, with our off-label form, you know, make sure you recognize that this is not um, – 100% accurate, you know, it's a estimation, um, have them sign that, um, recognize that this is off-label use, it's not 100% accurate, and that's kind of how we approach it, um, and we have our own form, so I can always send that as well, um, so I don't know if that answered your question, but it, we, we do have a fair amount of people that do that, um, so... Thank you. And I'd love to have that form. Maybe I can help persuade my health system that it's a viable thing to do. Yeah, I'll send it to you for sure. Hey, Rob. Nancy Myrick up in Escanaba. Yeah. Hey, um, I forgot what I was going to ask you. Shoot. Oh, are you doing that more for weaning or people not tolerating certain doses? Um, so we have a couple of people that we're tapering on below the 100. You know, I'll give them 75 and 50. I don't know if this is more of a mental uh, kind of process, but they're, they're doing pretty well with that. And then, um, we are doing some that, you know, that aren't tolerating the 300 cause it's, uh, it's too, it's too much for them. Uh, but the 100 doesn't seem to, um, you know, have a, a full effect. So I have a couple of people on 150 or 200, um, and they're just comfortable with that. Um, so I don't think you're wrong by doing that. You know, if you're, if you're doing the correct, you know, examination and, and having the discussion with the patient. So. Yeah, my only experience with it, I, I read about it and, and have talked to you about it before. Mm -hmm. um, I just had one patient who really was not tolerating even 100. She was a very uh, thin patient yeah. Um, yeah. and would have nausea and vomiting for two days after every injection. Finally, I just yeah. went down to 75 and she did wonderful. Yeah. So yeah. Much better. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I don't think I, it's unreasonable at all. Um, yeah. you know, as long as you have that discussion and have that form and um yeah i haven't used it for tapering at all because i haven't honestly in my experience i've been using supplicate for three years and have had actually very good um success with patients just stopping after mm -hmm. the 100 when when they were ready some has been six months some have been two and a half years yeah. um and have have really had really nice feedback from patients I've seen in follow up that honestly haven't had the experience that your patient had, Paul, that was in jail. Um, thankfully, my patients have been doing okay, um, but just wanted to share what my experience has been um, after just stopping it. I typically do at least six months. Um, I don't recommend people. I have not experienced the one and done. I've read about that. And I have not done that. I, one article I read, it was only 50% effective. I'm like, well, that's not very effective. So I've been recommending patients do at least six months. That's just my experience. And I think that case series with the um, one and done was specifically noted they are on low dose sublingual prior to that. So um, a very select patient population, if if appropriate at all. Thanks, Dr. Trowbridge. Thanks, Dr. Myrick and Dr. McMorrow. Uh, Dr. McMorrow, there are people that would like that form as well. If you wouldn't mind emailing that to me, I can get it to everyone. Yeah, absolutely. I'll have uh, my um, nurse uh, manager. Thank you. I'll continue to read uh, the questions in the Q&A. Um, how long does the lump in the belly region last? I have a patient who had it last year and still has two significant bumps to different areas. Highly variable. Um, had a fairly thin woman who, who got it, and you can actually, um, she was a little bit alarmed because bikini season came around and she had actually a ring from her prior, all her prior injections that were still present. Um, so months and months. Um, so that would not be shocking that, you know, that far down the line, there'd still be some, particularly for the 300 milligram doses. Thank you. From Kathy, can Sublocade be used like Suboxone for opioid abuse in, ad in addition to in addition to pain control? 
it is absolutely still an, an opioid, so it will provide some analgesia. That being said, and I don't know if uh, anyone else wants to ring in with their experience, generally speaking, I've had um, people say that the analgesic effects are less than taking sublingual more frequently, um, but um, I don't have tons of experience if anyone else has thoughts on that. Yeah, Paul, uh, Francie Myrick again in Escanaba. I would agree um, with that. My patients that have been on buprenorphine for chronic pain find the sublocate not as effective. Some are doing fine and willing to put up with their small residual, but other patients don't do as well. Thank you. Okay, from Dr. Cates, any recommendations for talking to pharmacists regarding supplementation during initiation? Some of our local pharmacies refuse to fill any supplemental buprenorphine, citing this is not in the literature. Um, it's very common practice, and um, if you go back to the original study that for the approval of Sublocade, I mean, again, they didn't use supplemental buprenorphine, but they certainly used a lot of medications to help with the effects of withdrawal. Um, the company very freely acknowledges that in the in the report. And um, again, their, their benchmark that they're trying to keep the levels above had nothing to do with withdrawal or urges to use. It had everything to do with this construct of keeping 70% of the opioid receptors blocked. So I've had very limited experience talking to pharmacists because I just haven't run into resistance. I, I did send that study to one pharmacist and they, I think they were just particularly grumpy, so we sent them to a different pharmacy. I've had this discussion also in other talks, and one of the things I would say is make sure that your prescription says PRN, so you're not just reordering their old amount of Suboxone or Subutec and just filling the whole month. You want to likely give them a smaller amount and make sure it says PRN. They, don't, they shouldn't really need a full amount that they were taking before. Um, so I typically give maybe, you know, 10 or 14 um, for the first month and then, you know, either none or very little the second or third month. But make sure it says PRN. Yep, I, I do that exact same thing and then tend to go with a very low dose of like two to four milligrams on a given day because, you know, it doesn't teach tend to take much to keep people out of the withdrawal at the end of the month, unless they had a pretty monster habit going in. Yeah, just a quick follow-up, uh, Dr. Cates. Have you reached out to the pharmacy beforehand and kind of give them a heads up? That's what I usually do. Um, yeah. They've been... Yeah, it's so it's it's a couple different pharmacies. Some of our pharmacies are, are really good, and it's, it's not an issue. There's a couple specific ones, and we've reached out to them and called them and, you know, had discussion of, Hey, you know, just based on the physiology of this medication, right. You know, most, you know, they're, you know, it's, it's, you know, if they're getting, you know, if somebody is getting, you know, 16, 20 milligrams and they get an, you know, sublingually and then they get an injection and we're supplementing with a couple of milligrams a day, just had a discussion of you know, the physiology of the medication. It's unlikely to, it's unlikely to cause, you know, to cause any, uh, any significant issues during due to ceiling effects of the medication and and you know and just and so we had you know those discussions and talked with them and they've just said they said to us and, and again it's part of it is you know is a pharmacy culture and we've just basically said hey we you know we have a hard time with these pharmacies but they basically said until you can show us a protocol in the literature we're not going to do that and you know like you said Dr. Trubridge it does mention you know we, we pointed out that you know, in the literature and in, in the studies that it does show that, you know, they did supplement with medications, but, um, and so it's just kind of a little bit of a challenge. And honestly, we, we kind of feel like it's a little bit of a, uh, you know, a, a, maybe a little bit of stigma and maybe a little bit of just unfamiliarity with the treatment. And so um, we've just kind of had to say that, okay, there are just certain pharmacies that just we can't work with. Most of the pharmacies work well, you know, especially with, you know, as you were saying, you're writing, you know, as you know, PRN for symptoms of, op of opioid withdrawal, that usually seems to work okay. Are there any pharmacists on the call that have anything to maybe contribute to this topic? Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Thanks. I, I added myself the PharmD in the in the uh, list, so there's probably no hiding. Um, uh, as a pharmacist, I mean, I, I wouldn't have a problem necessarily document, you know, dispensing Suboxone. I would imagine that 
unless they're very unfamiliar with it, their main concern is liability. Can I absolutely make sure that this is the intent that, that it's for breakthrough or for dose weaning or uh, what have you? So they probably just want to know a little bit more about why it's being prescribed to be sure that they are not um, prescribing it to a patient who unknownst to the physician is also being prescribed supplicate. So it's, it's probably more of a liability type thing. Um, uh, so perhaps, you know, it may, it may help them if in the SIG you, you specifically indicate exactly what its utility is for. And even in the non-clinical notes, the pharmacy indicate your awareness, they're taking supplicate concomitantly. I mean, I, I would think that would, um, it would certainly relieve my uh, liability concerns when filling a prescription like that. Thank you for that, Jesse. Any other comments on this topic? So this is uh, this is Tyler Genema from Penn Farm in Marquette. How are you guys doing? Hi, Tyler. Thanks for being here. Yeah, of course. Um, so I kind of uh, would echo what. Jesse is saying as well. And I just kind of reached out to my other pharmacists as well to see if they had any other concerns. And I can see if they'll chime in on our chat here. Um, but fr from a clinical standpoint, I wouldn't have any issues so long as it was the same, you know, the same physician or the same practice prescribing the sublocade and suboxone. I would assume some of the challenges, Dr. Cates, that you're having are kind of similar to just the general essence of challenges that we have with uh, some of the pharmacies in, in the area and region. And I don't think it probably has as much to do as uh, with the kind of concomitant use of sublocate and suboxone as it does just kind of the overall challenges that we're having. So thank you. I'll move on to the next question. Are there tips for handling the dopaminergic decline in the last week or in the event of delayed dose? I've not seen withdrawal symptoms or cravings return, but delayed doses often have patients complaining of depressed mood. I've had a little bit of that like loss of energy and motivation without flat out depression, but honestly, the decline in the, the amount of um, buprenorphine in the system is so slow that I, I, honestly, the most often thing I see is people just don't ever really hit substantial uh, withdrawal before they recognize, oh, I missed my appointment and I should probably call in and get that scheduled. Um, uh, by far the most common thing is they feel fine, which is, and they miss their appointment because they don't have their medication counting down for them. I don't, I don't know if anyone else has seen d depression, but I haven't seen much of that. Yeah, I, I haven't either. This is for Auntie Myrick again. Um, I have not seen that. And once they've been on the sublocade six, nine months a year, they're coming every six weeks because they forget their appointment um, and not having any issues. So I, I, I would really question what else is going on from the mental aspect, you know, um, that might be leading to them feeling that depression. I have had people miss taking their suboxone and that can play some mental challenges with them in the first few months um, because they're not getting that little kick that they're used to. So that could be part of what they're experiencing. Um, but I haven't had people specifically complain of ongoing depression at the end of the month or missing a dose. The thing I have seen now that I'm thinking about it though is um, if someone start to develop withdrawal early when they previously hadn't um, and their mood gets wonky. Con con concurrent stimulant use, um, of course, is a huge issue right now. And that, that will definitely uh, throw you into withdrawal much quicker and screw with your mood. So um, I have seen that a fair bit, but not directly what you're asking about. Okay. Um, from Kathy, have you used Lucemira with sub sublocade weaning or for withdrawals? Actually, I had to look up what that was. I was thinking it was lofexidine, but I wasn't entirely sure because uh, I use it very infrequently because um, clonidine generally does a, a good job and it's cheaper. Um, I have used it a couple of times with people who had private insurance and it was covered by, though I think actually Medicaid covers it now. 
Um, the only real difference I think, and I don't have tons of experience with this, is um, less hypotensive effects than clonidine. But otherwise, clonidine tends to do a pretty good job, and I use a fair bit of that when tapering people. I would love anyone else's opinion on that because I don't use lofexidine very often. Yeah, I don't. I don't use that at all, uh, too much either. Um, you know, clonidine. I, I'm pretty safe with that. And, you know, while well, the cost has actually changed with the uh, the Simra, but um, yeah, I, I don't really use it too often. More if they're on a uh, you know trying to get them through the uh, uh, withdrawal from IV fentanyl, or I've, I've used that a couple times because we have some samples here, but um, not uh, really tapering with the uh, bup. Um, so. I've been using a lot of clonidine with um with crank being around in the fentanyl supply with people not quite knowing what to do with that. So modest success. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Um hey Paul, where are you that you're seeing that? Because I haven't seen that in the UP yet. Uh, Grand in Rapids. Alabama. You're in Grand Rapids. It uh, seems to be, and I think the information out of Denver is consistent with what our local uh, agencies are finding is exclusively in the fentanyl supply, not in the heroin supply, though we have very limited heroin in the area. Now, anyway, it's all fentanyl. Um, but it, we, we are gauging about 25% of our local fentanyl supply probably has um, the, the trank in it. So. Hey, Paul, real quick, you know, because I'm seeing so much IV fentanyl, and you are too. I m most of the time, you know, I, it used to not be like this a few years ago, or even four or five years ago when I was in New York. But I would say more than half the time, I'm I'm keeping patients on a maintenance of 300 milligrams, um, you know, as opposed to stepping it down. Um, I know there's some decent literature coming out keeping it above four nanograms per ml. Um, so I don't know, you know, kind of your input and what you're seeing. I do see patients do a lot better anecdotally, especially if they're IV using fentanyl, staying on the 300. So now I'm just even, you know, kind of keeping them on that, um, you know, just from my experience. So I'd love to hear your feedback. Thank you. I 100% agree with you. Um, with fentanyl just being so potent, I mean, buprenorphine in general is becoming a less useful tool. So we're using higher doses Saw some, um, Eliza sent some studies about using 32 milligrams a day of buprenorphine to try to get that marginal benefit out of peaking that out. But frankly, I'm, I'm sending a lot of people to detox and methadone because we just can't get on top of their habits with buprenorphine right now. So yeah, higher doses seem very reasonable to be very loose with right now. Is anyone else seeing that as well or not? I've certainly read about it. I, we we haven't had a ton of IV fentanyl up here. I've had some patients come from downstate and come up here, um, but not so much from our local area. But even patients that come to me on the higher doses of buprenorphine, whether it's on the street or from a prescription, I've stayed on the 300 a lot longer. They tend to do much better um, on the 300. Um, so kind of my cutoff has been, you know, if they're on 16 or less, I'll I'll probably go down to the 100. Um, but if they've been on 24 or more, I've been leaving them longer until they're well into uh, recovery to even consider going down. I've read about having to with this high high dose fentanyl going on, like you said, Paul, um, using methadone first. Um, to get them more stable and then later whatever later is months or whatever at some point transitioning then over to buprenorphine because that's a lot easier to do than to try to get them from fentanyl to buprenorphine yeah I have a lot of people are on 24 milligrams a day just languishing in withdrawal still and I mean probably 75 percent of my new opioid patients are coming in with no heroin in their system any longer. We just have no heroin locally. It's all it's all fentanyl. So I got people I'm putting up on 300 milligrams a day who are, had um, snorting habits, which is I, I wouldn't have even considered a couple of years ago. So thank you for the great discussion and the great questions. Um, please feel free to continue to add your questions in the Q and A section. 
Um, I am going to go ahead and address some questions that came in through um, the registration list. Um, there's a question about what to do in post-op patients uh, if they're on sublocade to manage pain. I go to is kind of um, fentanyl, fentanyl PCA, because you can uh, titrate it well. Um, and you, at the end of the day, you have a, you have your 24 hour dose, um, which you can transition to a patch if it's covered. And it has a, a um, fairly good binding. If of all the commercially available opioids, it has the closest binding affinity to that of buprenorphine. So it has a chance to compete. So I, I try to err on the side of using fentanyl and fentanyl patches post-operatively. Um, you can also, um, though it's ooh, somewhat less effective at the higher doses of buprenorphine, just increase your oral opioids to a time and a half to two times the normal dose, and you get some opioid effect um, breaking through there. I don't know if anyone else has any other. Yeah, this is Francie Myrick again. So I've had some experience with that as well. Um, I haven't done the fentanyl because I don't do any hospital management anymore, um, but certainly one and a half to two times um, often I'll use some Percocet short term. And I, I try to have conversations with the surgeons because they will definitely underdose if they're not, you know, fully informed of the need for the higher dose. And a lot of the surgeons are not aware of that. Um, so I try to have that conversation if I know a patient's going to be having surgery. Of course, you leave them on your sublocate or your buprenorphine that you're already on. Some surgeons have said you had to get off all that stuff before I give you surgery. Um, yeah. Lack of understanding. And I have run into one pharmacy, um, shall be nameless, but I'm sure most of the UP people can figure it out, that refused to give any Percocet because the patient was already on buprenorphine and that went above and beyond what they were comfortable with. So I had to find a different pharmacy to fill that. Um, so again, that lack of understanding and education is widespread, but it does work because that works if you go one and a half of what you usually were going to do. And I, have, I have, haven't had people coming back telling me they need more, you know, and they're done, they're done. I agree with you 100% about contacting the surgeon beforehand, and I actively make a grab to take over perioperative pain management so that it goes smoothly or as smoothly as I can make it going with. Yep, I've had to do that too. I just say, I will be more than happy to manage that for you. And they're like, thank you. <laughs> so yeah, I do too. Yep. Okay, thank you. Um, how do we go about getting our patients into a program? How do we learn to feel comfortable handling this as a general OB? Um, there's another question also about what are the requirements um, from the DEA, et cetera, to provide sublocate? How do I implement this service at my practice? Kind of questions around the same uh, processes. Um, I don't know that there's magic about getting comfortable with it beyond um, having someone to help hold your hand, which I think the Michigan Opioid Collaborative is exactly that group to do that for you, to help you um, uh, walk through the process of getting comfortable using buprenorphine and having someone to be able to call with, with specific questions. So I think that is essentially our function um, to to be the people to come to um, when you when you want to start something up like this. I don't know if you have anything else specific to say, Melissa. Uh, logistics of the sublocate in general are, as I kind of laid out, it's kind of a, a little bit of a pain because you do have to have someone who's working the logistics of getting it sent from the specialty pharmacy unless you're doing buy-in bill, um, which buy-in bill is a total game taber, but a pretty heavy lift for a system unless you're doing a fair number of these. Um, but Otherwise, you having someone do the logistics and calling the pharmacies and making sure they're delivering things on time. Um, I don't think. I... I can share my experience because I've been through both the pharmacy side and the buy and bills. So, um, yeah, when I just decided I was going to do it, I was all gung ho for it. First came out, Medicaid said they'll cover it. I said, I'm going to do it. So I had some nurse um, support staff that did all the legwork and figured out how do you order it from the specialty pharmacies. Um, we contacted, uh, you know, the drug rep to come in and, and provide some information, um, give us some, um, you know, tools that we, we needed and had my girls all watch the video on how to inject it. And, you know, you do your first one and it's like a little scary, but you just go for it. And 
um, that's how you get started. And then we were able to transition eventually to uh, buy and bill because I am connected to a hospital pharmacy. Um, and so they hold it for me. And that's made the world a difference on uh, cutting down our work, calling the specialty pharmacy. So I'm very happy we've done that. But I do know that at least locally here in the UP, we have um, one local pharmacy, um, Peninsula, who is on the call today, Tyler. Um, who is actually getting it right in his pharmacy. So there may be pharmacies in your area that um, may be able to, to supply that locally and not have to worry about the shipping. Because I started this during COVID and we'd had shipping delays and you know lots of hassles. So it was so nice for me to have it right here at our pharmacy. But now our local pharmacy also carries it and would deliver it to our office if need be. Um, so there may be some, some alternatives there. We didn't, I don't know if you talked about this earlier, Paul, but in my early experience with this, we did have one case of subcutaneous or excuse me, intradermal injection um, and learned from that uh, greatly and have never done it since. Um, so, you you know, you want to read up about that to make sure that you're injecting properly so that does not happen. I did have another case present to me. Sorry, that's my watch. Um, another case that came from prison we hadn't in, done the injection, but they had already done it at prison and she had an in, intradermal injection and was in pretty fluorid withdrawal. So I've had two patients with that experience, one that we did and one we did not. Um, so definitely something to be aware of, especially early on. Hopefully that's helpful. Absolutely. And can't overstate how useful it is to have a, a local pharmacy working on this. I remember, uh, I think Sublocated was approved first the year of the polar vortex um, and we were getting it shipped up from Florida. And so the Magellan Pharmacy down there was the closest, and it was just a disaster um, getting patients their medications on time. Um, do you, out of curiosity, do you um, register yours? Since you're doing buy and build, do you register yours in MAPS? Because I, I know a clinic down the street from here who is doing buy and build, and they do not, and that seems very dangerous to me. We do not because there is not a mechanism, and we've called and spoken with the powers of B of MAPS, there's no mechanism for our hospital to do that. So if you think about it, when they go to the ER or they're in the hospital and they get morphine, that shows nowhere. It doesn't show up on MAPS. So neither does my supplicate. Um, so it is an issue and they are aware of it because we talked to them about it. And they said there is no current mechanism for hospitals to do that. Makes me so, yeah. really worried that, particularly since it lasts like 12 months in someone's system, if someone was incarcerated, wanted to get on Vivitrol as their option, and the person who is providing services didn't recognize that they had been been given sublocate at some point in time, it just seems like a, a anticipatable situation that could easily arise. So Yes, I, I agree with you, and we didn't have a good solution when we spoke with them, because that issue came up as a question, why is it not showing up? But it doesn't show up, you know, when they get morphine either, but you're right for the long term, which brings me to a, a good question because I just had this case. I had a patient who was one year out from Sublocade who wanted to go on Vivitrol to try to help with her meth use. Um, and she had very little still in her urine, but did experience, we, she went ahead and did it because she had been on Vivitrol before um, and did experience a few days of mild withdrawal, nothing that was horrible, but um, I don't know if anybody else had that kind of experience of, you know, how long do you wait? And I didn't think I'd have to wait longer than a year, but it, she still had some mild withdrawal at a year. Anybody else have that experience at all switching? That'd be really awesome to actually write that case up. Um, Cause I don't think anyone knows the answer to this. My solution has been potentially thinking about doing a, like a naloxone challenge in the office beforehand. Uh, to see if they can do it and get away with it longer term with just short term discomfort if if we're wrong. So yeah, thankfully it was just mild and you know the level was low, but it was still detectable. We are at three minutes to one o'clock. So I just want to say thank you so much, Dr. Trowbridge, for the presentation. Thank you to the other physicians and pharmacists and other folks that participated in the discussion and questions. Uh, this is what we really hope to foster with these roundtables. So um, I do want to add that the Michigan Opioid Collaborative does do 
uh, patient consults, uh, we connect you with a physician that's on call and they will contact you that same day to help you with your questions around treating patients with substance use disorder. I also wanna add that we do technical assistance. So again, if you can um, use the link I posted in the chat, uh, that will bring you right to our website to request uh, a consult for a patient, treating a patient or more for technical assistance. And we will make sure that we uh, get back to you. So thank you so much everyone for attending today. Thank you again to everybody who's contributed and I hope that you have a good day.